so uh, I think it's uh, to try and keep somewhat on time today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start the afternoon uh, uh, session. Um, and our first uh, speaker uh, giving a plenary talk will be Peter Wallenis. Uh He's from uh, Rice. And he's going to talk about the uh, genomic energy landscapes. And I think you all know him from his pioneering work on protein folding and the energy landscapes uh, concept there. Okay. Well, th thank you, Zan, um, and thank, uh, I thank the organizers, and I thank the uh, uh, Bulgarian people who must have gone to a lot of trouble to uh, organize this in, in, the, uh, in here. Uh, I know you had to negotiate with difficult people uh, in all likelihood. Um, uh, the title, of course, is made up of buzzwords, as all titles should be, um, but, but there's a little bit of content there's a little bit of content uh, to it. Uh, you know, we don't need to use energy landscapes to describe perfect gases. And we don't need energy landscapes to de describe the simple properties of free polymers. The idea of landscapes are that you need to use landscape ideas when there are states that persist for a certain period of time. Maybe they persist for extremely long periods of time. Maybe they persist only for uh, modest periods of time. But the idea is that you have to have a variety of states that the system might be in, and there have to be some persistent features. And as you've been hearing, there are certainly some persistent features of the structure of the, uh, of the chromosome. Now, that being said, uh, you know, the ideas of energy landscape theory have been developed in the context of problems like glasses uh, and proteins. And in my own case, I've worked in both those areas. And, and of course, being a protein person, uh, you know, I always have to apologize uh, to uh, people in the chromatin area because, uh, you know, I'm not an, a ribonucleic acid person, for example. I know the RNA people, whenever I've met them, I remember meeting Tom Cech and Aki Uhlenbeck just when he discovered uh, the ribozyme, and he said, uh, explained it to me. I said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, and then, uh, then, then uh, uh, he said, well, you should work on that, uh, which I didn't do. Uh, and since then, RNA people have been on my case. DNA people also often are on my case. And of course, most we're, mostly we're going to be focusing on things that are very DNA-centered. Um, but I should say that I have a lot of affection for DNA and even a long history with DNA. Um, this is, uh, of course, the famous paper, uh, an entirely theoretical paper, by the way, uh, on the structure of the DNA uh, new, uh, uh, molecule. Uh, I can say that because Francis Crick's um, wife told me that he always considered himself a physicist and a theoretician because he just didn't do experiments. Um, and, uh, and this paper appears uh, uh, four days after I was born. So uh, I guess I couldn't have rushed a paper in very quickly uh, uh, at this time. Uh, but, um, but, you know, this DNA structure of course, captured the imaginations of uh, people very, very quickly. Um, and, uh, and actually, I got interested in DNA very soon thereafter, I guess, by modern standards. Uh, this is my work on the chromosome in 1964. So that's only 11 years after the structure. It's actually probably 10 years after the structure, because this was a strange picture. Um, I, I, I did pretty well uh, um, at this uh, thing. Uh, and you can see that I was already doing coarse-grained models of biomolecules. Um, uh, and uh, although, um, and I'll come back to some features of this model, uh, I was all, but this actually was mostly an experimental project because I had learned that you got the start on this genetic code issue by Chargraff's rules. Chargraff's rules were done by sort of analyzing what makes up the DNA, and there was this weird pattern that G equals C and A equals T, a pattern that wasn't known to Watson and Crick but was something their model immediately predicted and gave them a great, uh, great feeling about. So this is actually the experiment I was doing, which was on chromatography to try to show how you could figure out what things were made up of. Now, there are many features of that model. Uh, the, the only feature that it has is it involves the GCAT rule. Uh, so it has something to do with the proximity of the coarse-grained objects. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> 
It has so, 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 so we, the input knowledge to this model is that you know something about the proximity of the base pairs. Um, and also, because it had a very regular structure, the assumption that it would be a helix. Now, of course, I didn't have to assume that. Everyone assumed that every biomolecule was a helix starting in around 1930. Because if there was going to be a repetitive rule for a polymer of any type, you take a repetitive rule and you keep using it over and over. And if there's going to be only one structure from that, it has to be a helix. It's just math. Now, you can see that those features are correct. They're correct features about DNA. But many other things inferred from those small pieces of experimental data and general mathematical knowledge are wrong. So, for example, this has only writhe and no twist. Uh, yes, only writhe and no twist. The correct structure, which I suppose if I knew that there was some journal called Nature when I was 11 years old, I could have found out that this wasn't the right structure, but, but I didn't know that. Now, I would say that when I've re-entered the field of the chromosome in the last few years, uh, you know, I come in again without many preconceptions about how things are supposed to work on the microscopic scale, and I think that that may be both a strength and a weakness of this way of thinking about things. Uh, and, I and I think it also might be a problem for other people. I think we have to be aware that there may be very subtle kinds of order that, uh, that exist at these intermediate scales, and it's going to be hard to infer them from scratch, and it may also be very hard to directly observe them experimentally. On the other hand, uh, one has to start and do something. Um, and uh, we started, and the we in this case was uh, Bin Zhang, one of my postdocs, one of uh, my very, very talented people over, I am averaging over my entire career. I've had many talented people that I work with, like Jose and Zan, for example. But, but Bin is also really, really talented. He's now assistant professor at MIT. Um, and uh, and uh, we were hearing about Arez's work and uh, uh, came up with this uh, question, you know, what, what, was there a sort of objective way to take the information about the probabilities of contacts and infer something about an energy function and an energy landscape that would describe uh, chromosomes? Um, so you've, of course, heard about this sort of experiment that gives you an ensemble average of the probability of two things coming together. This is kind of like Chargraff's rules. G's are all, most of the time near C's, and A's are most of the time near T's, and stuff, but it's even weaker than the, than the Chargraff rule thing. So you might not be able to infer as much about a structure here. Um, and of course, yeah, as we said, we want to turn around the experimental contact map, which is, after all, population average, and then try to understand what would be the forces that give rise to that? Let me move things along. So the idea is that, uh, of course, we're not going down to the microscopic level. So we're coarse graining the description of the polymer. We're using the same idea as in 1964. We have a bunch of polystyrene beads. <laughs> they're not actually polystyrene here anymore. They're, they're in a computer. Uh, they represent something like 40 uh, kilobases in, the f in most of the pictures that I'm showing here. So this is actually a very, very gross, uh, gross model. And there's clearly structure on scales much shorter than even a single uh, uh, polystyrene bead here. Uh, and in fact, I would say probably a lot of the most interesting uh, stuff is going on below this length scale that I've, that I've shown you here. Um, and uh, I think as the experimental information has improved in the last few years, it's, there's, no in, there's no computational problem with incorporating that into a similar model, but at lower, um, uh, lo smaller uh, effective beads. Uh, one does assume that something that's 4,000 base pairs around has some excluded volume. Uh, so the bare model also has excluded volume between these things. But of course, if they had real excluded volume and could not pass each other just like the polystyrene spheres, this would give rise to extremely slow relaxations because of the phenomenon of entanglements that, uh, that uh, uh, Alexander Grossberg was telling us about. So in fact, we deliberately uh, set up a model where these beads are able to pass through each other at modest cost. They still are slowed down from crossing, but, but not, not very much. And then the question is, what are the other forces uh, that we might have there? What's the rest of the Hamiltonian? Uh, normally, and most uh, other people would say, uh, make up an idea of what these forces are, uh, run a simulation, get a result, compare it to experiment. This is very inefficient because that experiment has so many pieces of data in it. Uh, it's very hard to fit everything unless you use a small number 
unless it happens miraculously that a small number of parameters works. And uh, as, you, as you heard this morning from Jose, in the end, it does turn out that a small number of parameters could be made to fit this. But I wanted to take a more agnostic viewpoint uh, and turn this around, uh, partly because I admitted that I don't know enough about the forces on this length scale to, um, to, to just postulate them. Um, and that just as years ago in protein folding, I admitted that uh, the miyazawa jernigan model was not the correct description of all forces in, in proteins. Um, and that then allowed us to learn from experimental information what the force laws ought to be. Um, so how can you do this in some uh, uh, reasonably organized way? Well, there probably are an infinite number of ways of doing it. And in fact, uh, a fair fraction of that infinite number have been tried by other people. Uh, mostly these have been tried with the idea that, that there's some unique structure that the molecule uh, has. That's actually a very good approximation for proteins, but I think it's a rather poor approximation for these chromosomes. These ensembles are really like those of what I might call a denatured protein in a molten globule state. Um, they're relatively compact, but there's still a lot, and there's persistent elements of structure, so that's why we can use landscapes, but the, but other, but the system is rather uh, diverse in its number of states. So one way to do this is something that uh, the more philosophical call the maximum entropy principle. You imagine that there's some measure of the of uh, Hamiltonians that are sensible. Um, and you ask, what would be out of all possible Hamiltonians of chain molecules, uh, which are the ones that would require uh, making the fewest additional assumptions beyond the experimental data? So that sort of problem is something you can solve variationally. It actually tells you that, roughly speaking, the Hamiltonian has a structure of some uh, background Hamiltonian that you, uh, contains the information you know is true, like chains are uh, connected and so forth. Uh, uh, and then on the other hand, the experimental measurements, uh, if the experimental measurements tell you about pairs of distances, say they tell you, uh, if they told you, gr what would be great is if they told you the probability distribution of every pair of distances. But suppose that you just know some average where there's some experimental number f that tells you how likely you get a signal if two things are r away then it turns out that the solution of this variational problem has the form of coefficients times this effective interaction. The high C measurement basically measures whether these globs somewhere or other come in contact, and so that determines the form of F, at least in, in some a general way. We could all debate that in, in detail. The problem, though, is to learn these parameters alpha, or I guess they turn to gamma on this page. So when you solve the variational problem for the coefficients, it turns out that this gives the same result as something that was very familiar to us in protein folding. In protein folding, we say that the model that works the best is the one that gives the most funnel-like landscape you can have to explain the, the crystal structures of known proteins. Uh, you have a similar thing here. You evaluate the energy uh, with your experimental known contacts, so that's the information that's there in the, in this case, unfolded polymer chain to some extent. You compare that with what you would have gotten if you didn't have any potentials at all, and you take, measure that in units of the variation of energy in terms of gammas. That's also what we have in, uh, in, pro in folding proteins. It's how we've learned energy landscapes for proteins over the years from data on crystal structures. But of course, we don't have crystal structures here, but we do have this average uh, value of the probability of contacts. So this allows you to determine this gamma ij by an iterative process. Um, so we're just learning from uh, the experiments. We're not uh, making any hypotheses other than this. So in that sense, I think this is very interesting in that it's, it's, it's a relatively objective rewriting of the experimental data. Uh, and you might say a minimalist one. You assume uh, nothing else but that there's something here that is like an energy function. And I'll come back to Alexander Grossberg's question later if he asks me about why we can assume that to some approximation. Um, but in any event, uh, it's rather objective. And you can just ask, of course, the most trivial thing. You want it to fit the data. Does it fit the data? The answer is this thing fits the data really quite well. OK. Uh, you have an exper the experimental uh, uh, contact map and you have the simulated contact map. They're clearly not identical, but there's always going to be 
uh, sampling errors and the like. So fine, uh, there's no prediction here, we're just redoing the data. Why do you want to do it? And this is again where, where um, landscape ideas come in. We can now start to ask, how big is the ensemble? How many diverse structures are there? Are there various statistical measures? Are there some features of the ensemble that are common from example to example? Uh, as well as, are there any peculiar things about this energy of interaction that we didn't, we assumed we didn't know that we can get out of the experimental data? So, so a lot of uh, what I'm going to show you here is the, again, the work of uh, Bin Zhang. Uh, and some of the things are sort of uh, obvious. Uh, you end up with, yes, there's lots and lots of structures. That's why I've been saying it's more like a molten globular protein than like a folded protein. You could do that by, uh, by just looking. And I, let's see, I think... This is a movie, although why can't I? Yeah, so you just see there's lots of structures. Okay, that's kind of an obvious thing. Um, and this is being colored by what we call spectral coloring uh, from one end of the molecule to the other end of the molecule. <laughs> Nothing much to see there except that there's lots of different structures. You can see that regions sometimes are long, sometimes they're short. Um, you have patterns. This is also a movie, but because I'm having trouble, I won't show this movie. Uh, you do find this pattern that there's a phase segregation between the things that are in high expression levels and low expression levels. Um, and since we're only simulating one uh, chromosome here, it turns out that uh, the low expression levels are on the outside and the high expression levels are the inside. Of course, in the cell, we have more than one chromosome, and this really is a problem about phase separation, as we've seen, and probably has to do with surface tensions of various types and also the, how big the droplets actually are. Um, so I don't want to say too much about that, but of course one of the oldest problems in DNA, which we heard a little bit about from S uh, Sasha Go uh, uh, Grossberg, um, and, and you know where he's contributed a, a great deal, is a problem that actually surfaces in the second paper by Watson and Crick. They say, well, there's a problem here if we have these entwined chains, and I'm trying to duplicate things. How do I keep them from getting entangled? Isn't it going to be like this mess that I have here? That's in the second paper, two months later, by Watson and Crick. And they said, well, we think this problem will be solved somehow, perhaps by cutting through the chain. George Gamow had a very interesting mechanism where you don't have to have topoisomerases to do it, but topoisomerases turned out to be uh, the correct answer. So, of course, if you say this, then you might have said, well, if you had just topoisomerases acting, and if all it does is let things pass through each other, as happens in this model, wouldn't the chain be knotted anyway? Um, and now this is where something interesting happens. Well, first of all, you go like, oh, it's not. So I've got to win a Fields Medal to, uh, to, to solve this problem. Well, the answer is I don't have to win a Fields Medal, um, but uh, uh, Sasha should have won a Fields Medal for a procedure that amounts to checking whether something has knots. So the way you do this, you connect the two ends together and then you shrink the chain and expand the parts of the chain simultaneously. And eventually, you can't undo it. And the volume of this is a, is a measure of how knotted that thing is. That's very knotted. That's what happens if all I do is confine a polymer chain to the, uh, to the size region uh, that it should have as a chromosome. Here's what happens when you put on that potential that we learned. When you let this shrink, it shrinks, and it shrinks, and it shrinks, and it shrinks, and you see it shrinks basically to a point. This is an, uh, on this length scale, the chromosome is unknotted. We didn't put that in. It's not something that comes from the algorithm. It's just something that comes out. You sometimes get things with two or three simple knots or something like that, but you, it's a completely different distribution than we would have if this was just a copolymer, and Jose showed you that distribution we had before. And I think this is... To my money, this actually shows that on this scale, it's unknotted. I think uh, Sasha's less uh, sanguine, perhaps, but I think, I think he, he postulated that would be true. It turns out to be true. I think it's demonstrated that it's true uh, by this. Um, now, what does the overall chromosome landscape look like? Well, uh, I've been saying things really look like a, a molten globule of a protein. Um, and by that, I mean there's actually lots and lots of different structures, and entropy is letting you sample all, a whole bunch of these. Uh, a key issue in this is are you sort of trapped in one of these structures for a long time? That, in that case, it would be like a glass, or are you circulating around amongst all of them? 
And what would these local structures look like? Well, the way you do this is a procedure that was introduced in the theory of glasses, which is called temperature quenching. What you do is you take, in this case, an information theory temperature. You just set it to zero, but very quickly, and you see where do you get stuck. So we can actually take any structure in that simulation, quench it to absolute zero, and find out what structure you get. Well, first of all, you get different structures. So the, the chromosome at this level is not a folded protein, where you would get the same structure most of the time when you do this. Um, instead, you get clusters of structures. This is major cluster one, major cluster two. Uh, there are several more clusters. Uh, actually, I don't know if we looked for all of them. And now you can ask a question. The overall thing is clearly occupying these structures. Uh, but is there some local order? And the way you do this is now that you know what the ideal local structure is, you could say, well, how similar are you to the local structure? You can get a similarity measure, which is how, it's almost like an RMS, it's how close are the contact patterns of the uh, uh, region you're looking at. And what you discover is the objects about the size, and in fact, the, the, the objects which, are, which were called uh, by some the topologically associated domains, they actually have a fairly high common set of contacts. They're very persistent, many of them. If you go much bigger or if you pick random parts of the, 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 uh, uh, the genome, things that don't correspond to those TADs, uh, then the similarity goes down. And then as you get to on long length scales, the similarity is almost non-existent. So what's happening is there's regions that have structure, but they're flickering in and out. And uh, that allows the whole chain overall to take up many different orientations. Well, how do these things uh, fold in and out? Well, now that you know what structure it's supposed to have, or you have an idea of it, you can now use the techniques that have been done in protein folding, which is to find what's the free energy profile as a function of how similar you are. And actually, for about 80% of these regions that are the TADs, these are actually the TADs here, they actually still have only a single minimum. They're so fluctuating, they're sort of still fluctuating around this halfway folded thing. Some of them clearly do have two-level-like behavior. And also, one of the things that I don't have a slide on is they turn out to be coupled, one TAD to the next TAD, and so on. Um, so this two-level switching means that this is really like the secondary structure of a, uh, of, of, of a protein even in one of these molten globule states. There's flickering formation of local structures, which actually, I didn't show it there, but look kind of like a distorted helix. Uh, so in some ways, this is like the secondary structure of proteins that continues to exist even in, even in the uh, unfolded state. What's shown here is a movie where things are being colored by whether they are the, um, whether they are in the, 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 the high Q basin or the low Q basin. And you can see that some things over the period of whatever, 7,000 seconds, which is uh, 10 hours or something? No. Um, uh, 36, uh, two hours. Uh, you actually have fluctuations, rather slow fluctuations of these local regions. Well, one of the things that we thought was, well, what are these, these helices kind of look distorted and bad. We wondered, in fact, could it be that they're distorted and bad because of a res? Namely, the experimental data is bad. I'm not sure that's true, but, but if, you're, if you think your experimental data might be bad, you say, well, how do we get it to be better? We average it. So what we did is you take the interactions that depend on i and j, and you average them over i and j. Now this now means that this is effectively a homopolymer of some sort. Um, and, uh, uh, and it depends, an interaction only depends on the sequence, genomic sequences. And, and this is what uh, Jose has been, that we started to call the ideal chromosome. So the real answer is it's that plus something else, which is disordering it. Might be experimental noise, but might be real signal. Uh, we, we don't, I, I don't think we know that just now. Uh, but anyway, you can ask, what does that structure become when you quench it of the ideal? And it turns out to be this, uh, uh, a bunch of helices that then become a superhelix of a bunch of helices. Now, I'm actually slightly embarrassed to find out only about a year ago, long after we published this paper, that this model for the chromosome also was proposed by Crick in a paper in the 1970s and has almost the same distance scales that we have here. He proposed this on the basis of the idea everything is helices, 
<laughs> and, the, and, and experiments that have to do with the degradation of chromosomes by, by uh, nucleases and how long the segments were in the degradation of nucleases. So, it's, so I think it's really, you know, it's got a lot of intellectual credibility that there are structures like this going on. You also look at this and you go like, huh, that looks like those, those things I saw in school of chromosomes or if you went to school, I was a dropout, but if you, if you went to school, you saw pictures in biology class of the mitotic chromosome. So, in fact, when you look at the structures of the mitotic chromosome by high C, they tend to be very um, uh, bland and uniform, kind of like the ideal chromosome. Uh, you can invert these data uh, and then find a Hamiltonian, and then you can just simulate it at the appropriate temperature and you get this object. Um, and you can see that, yes, this is banded, just the way they are in high school, uh, I guess, if you go to high school. Uh, and, um, um, and you also see, since it's a helix, and it's a helix of helices, it's got to have chirality. So the mitotic chromosome, indeed, uh, according to this, does have a chirality. How does it decide whether to be left or right? Well, in fact, we put a little bit of encouragement here because it gets very hard to get rid of chiral defects. Chiral defects have to be pushed off the end of the molecule. Uh, so I don't know whether the real chromosome is in fact chiral, but, uh, but at least some people think it is. This is a picture of two chromosomes soon after duplication, and uh, these, these fellows, uh, Delateur and Lemley, uh, uh, would claim when they look at these images that they're mirror images of each other. So I think that, first of all, this is a very important question for, I think, all of us here. This chirality is something that you cannot see in the contact map. You can only see it in fish or something like that, and it's something really to look for. One of the other lessons here is if we're going to have helices of some sort, that, again, means stuff is the only order parameter in the problem is not a scalar. It's not density. It, density is a parameter. Things are compact, open, and closed, for example. But there's also other order parameters having to do with orientation. I would say these things say there's elements of liquid crystallinity, but actually people have been saying there's liquid crystallinity in DNA for, for 25 years. If you look in dinoflagellate chromosomes, for example, they turn out to you know, behave like liquid crystals under cross polarizers. So we should all be on the lookout for other kinds of order than just the order that, uh, that is most apparent. Now, on the other hand, the interface, Chromosome, this is a very weak order and it's only fluctuating. It's not globally a liquid crystal, but the mitotic chromosome is globally liquid crystal. Um, well, as I said, things last for a long time. Uh, mitotic chromosome, obviously, for a very long time. What can we learn about these regions that are changing in structure? Well, first of all, we'd love an experiment that would tell us about these rates of opening and closing. We don't really have, uh, we weren't aware of any experiment that would directly, that had directly found that. On the other hand, there are a very bu a nice bunch of experiments that have been done by lots of people uh, following where markers go uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the chromosome. Uh, this was uh, one of these things is a, a study, I think this is maybe of the telomeres by a group of people, the first author being Bronstein and one being Elihu, oh my God, I'm losing it. Okay, uh, and what, anyway, they're able to follow in a plane uh, where these things are going. They're able to measure things like R squared versus time. Um, and these are the kind of plots that they get. And uh, these are described by them as uh, subdiffusive because if you look at R squared divided by T, Einstein would say that should come out to be a constant. Instead, it continuously decreases. You can see that the last time they get is something like 1,000 seconds. That's a little bit shorter than our simulation. Uh, but you can see that this is decreasing, which says that somehow it's at least sort of localized. Um, they also find that it's quite different for different uh, markers in different places. So overall, though, they all get a power law that they could fit to a value, uh, well, to, to a certain value. Uh, it's less than, it's not exactly the Rouse value. It's not a, the value you would have for a reptating chain. It's certainly not the Einstein value. Uh, and of course, this, of course, uh, the, the, the great thing about power, uh, power laws is it turns everyone into a theorist. All you have to do is buy some, buy some uh, log log paper. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and invoke Dijen. <laughs> uh, um, 
so, um, so there's been many, many discussions of this. There's nothing specifically fractal in the model that we've shown you. I don't think there certainly are structures within structures, but I, I don't think there's anything specifically there. Anyway, the interesting thing is that uh, when you follow these markers, there's variants of them, but much smaller, I would say, than experiments. So there's some other source of heterogeneity. And then on the other hand, the slope turns out to be about 0.3. This has to do with the phenomena that Jose was talking about earlier of the uh, uh, local phase separation of types. Um, and, uh, and in fact, this is not done with the direct inversion. This is done with the transferable model that Jose talked about earlier in the day. Uh, so this dynamics is nothing special. It's just Langevin dynamics powered by, prob by uh, possibly motors but stuff that on every individual bead looks like just a diffusion process um, with potentials. But it nevertheless gives alpha equals 0.3. Um, of course, we are very excited by these uh, 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 experiments that we were, I think we heard about from uh, Alexandra the, the other day, Alexandra Zadowska, where you sort of image the whole pattern looking at density fluctuations and correlating them. Um, yeah, you know, they're very pretty pictures. They're a little hard for us to compare because they're two-dimensional, whereas we do things in 3D. Uh, although they also have an interesting uh, kind of uh, order parameter, which is you can measure how does the apparent, I'll call it velocity, uh, over one time interval in one place correlate with the velocity of another time interval. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, uh, a certain distance away. Of course, the velocity on shortest time scales, they must be uncorrelated. That's the partition theorem. But, but uh, for longer time scales, if they're persistent structures, you can have uh, some flows. And uh, uh, we calculate those weird um, uh, velocity correlation functions. And uh, you can see, I think, on the left with the little microscope, these are Alexandra's uh, patterns at a variety of different times. These are the ones that come out in in this model for that correlation function. So, um, so there, there, uh, there's actually a large, there's actually a four point correlation function if you think about it. So it's a kind of a difficult thing to uh, formulate a simple uh, pencil and paper theory for, but it looks like this model has the main ingredients of this. It's very hard to ask for us uh, about the uh, further details about the, the structure uh, that might be the things that are involved in these overall flows. Uh, as, as they are described in, in the other model. Um, ah, sorry, I didn't show you. Yes, th these are the, but we can make plots of the same type. And there, there's your schooling fish over there. Um, and we use the same kind of scheme, but we actually put arrows on. And uh, this is work of uh, David Patoyan and Michele Vicero. Also, there's been a talk about uh, viscoelastic response to chromosome. I don't want to say too much about this. Anything that's more complicated, well, anything that's a chain molecule has viscoelasticity. So it's not a shock or a roux uh, that, that the chromosome has that. Uh, it's simply a way of describing the single particle motion. Uh, these are kind of the plots that people make in experiment at the top, no, sorry, experiment in the bottom. Uh, and uh, they have a show an interesting data collapse. You get a very similar data collapse, not as perfect for one very short time uh, data point. But most of them collapse to essentially the same kind of viscoelastic function. So I'll stop there. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll first acknowledge people and then say one or two remarks. Of course, uh, the later part of this work on the transferable model and things you heard about is done with Jose and people that are centered in his group, Ryan Cheng and Michele Di Piero. Uh, Arez has been a constant consultant. And as I said, Ben is a, you know, one of my uh, lucky uh, breaks to have had him as a postdoc. Now he's an assistant professor at MIT. Um, I think that when, when I look at this work, I see that, um, well, first of all, there's much more to do penetrating to the shorter length scales, which I think are uh, more interesting in, in a functional way. Uh, I think also it's very clear that there's kinds of order that are not obvious by any of the current measurements, and uh, except maybe that microscopy experiment by Lemley. Uh, and we're, we're going to just have to uh, be aware of these and also be aware that they're not going to be necessarily uh, obvious order parameters. They may be fluctuating order, but that may be all you need to get interesting phenomena like the flows that we're
I'll, I'll uh, you uh, Alec, you talk about it. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so we have time for uh, at least two questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Peter, first of all, thank you. I cannot agree more about the search for different order parameters, a different order. It is definitely, uh, again, I cannot agree more. My question to you is about the chapter of your talk about this Garini experiment uh, with subdiffusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said there is nothing specifically explicitly fractal in your model. I think that the way uh, this is obtained is, I forgot your notation for it. Jose in the morning called it gamma of D, this uh, decaying uh, interaction yeah, yeah, along yeah. the distance. And the power law which you encoded there propagated. I, 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 I agree. I, I meant that there's nothing. Uh, we, well, maybe a better statement would be we didn't particularly try to see whether there was motion within motion, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, yes, the gamma of D is a, is, is a critical thing. It's what gives rise to the ideal chromosome, for example. And, and, and uh, the gamma of D. Uh, and, and of course, we, we also have this rather agnostic viewpoint. We start from experimental data and then say this is the minimal model that would explain it. Uh, but you know, we don't know the cause. So for example, it could be that one has a fractal globule in your sense, a thing that was a, a, a chain that uh, was, uh, uh, say, a, a cylinder at one point and then expanded. And then when it collapsed, it goes back and doesn't have enough time. That alone may be enough to give gamma of D. Uh, but I've not computed that, but I think it's possible to go that way. I think it's also possible that this comes from order that's on shorter length scales than the length scale of the um, than the length scale of the uh, uh, the beads uh, that we have. And it's because there's so many phenomena where uh, DNA acts like a liquid crystal, and this is just the thing that gives rise to helical structures with liquid crystals. So I think it could be microscopic uh, from below, or it could be something that's uh, kinetic uh, from above. My point was much, much more modest. I just wanted to bridge between gamma of D and subdiffusion. I, I, I think it'd be nice to have an explicit pencil and paper theory of that. We didn't construct such a theory. But, but it would be nice to do that. OK, one, uh, one last question. There is. Hey, there's a wonderful talk. Um, one of the big challenges, I think, right now is that a lot of these inversion methods and other sort of physical simulation methods are successfully able to sort of calculate the first moment, right, the average contact frequencies, et cetera, uh, that you see in an ensemble. But I think that there's often a significant mismatch between the variability that you observe, uh, you know, when you look at a single cell, for instance, via microscopy assays, and the variability that's seen uh, when trying to invert high C matrices. And I was curious if you could comment on that, if you could well, comment on how we can go forward. Of course, that's very interesting. Um, uh, and in fact, I, I would say from the sort of glassy, like theories, there's a pretty objective way of of answering that by actually just looking at the fluctuations of the contact map during these simulations. I can also say I've asked Ryan Chang to do that for about a year or so. Uh, and he keeps saying that, that, he'll, that he's just too busy, but he'll get to it. Uh, uh, but that would be the objective way to do that. Yeah, yeah. You, you'll be permitted a 30 second rebuttal. I've taken, for example, the, the Bintu. Thank you. Um, I, I basically uh, w w have been able to compare uh, the variability in the simulated structures uh, for for the chromosomes with um, things like DNA tracing, uh, and and I find like the variability. I mean, is, is consistent between the two. Um, I mean, I can comment on this more if, if you guys like, but I, I don't see the this discrepancy that you're mentioning, Eris. Yeah. yeah, that's great news, and I'm really happy you've finally done that. Uh, 